Welcome uh, to uh, this uh, ORF webinar on Afghanistan. Uh, this is the second webinar which we are holding and we plan to do a couple of more uh, on the evolving situation in Afghanistan. Uh, the first one was on a purely Indian perspective of how uh, people view what is happening in Afghanistan and the policy options for India. Uh, but this time uh, we want a regional perspective on what is happening important players in the region, how uh, they uh, see the evolving situation. Uh, and, and since we have people from different countries uh, joining in, uh, we wanted a perspective on what are the apprehensions and expectations uh, in, in various countries around Afghanistan on, uh, on, on what is happening out there. Uh, so without uh, much ado, uh, we are very thankful for having a fabulous panel. Uh, we have Ambassador Ashraf Haidri. He is the Afghan ambassador in Colombo. Uh, and uh, on a very short notice, I must thank him uh, for agreeing to uh, be on this panel because uh, it would not have been fair to talk about Afghanistan without an Afghan voice. And many people are doing this and we didn't want to do this. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have Dr. Madhya Afzal, uh, who is a senior uh, foreign policy fellow in the Brookings Institution. She's written a fabulous book on Pakistan, uh, Pakistan Under Siege. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, she brings to, with her a unique perspective because uh, she knows and understands uh, how Pakistan is looking at what is happening. But she also has an ear to the ground in Washington, where she's based. Uh, so she comes with that perspective. We have uh, an independent journalist from uh, Dushanbe, uh, Anahita uh, Semidinova, uh, and uh, uh, my, my, although I've seen her on an earlier webinar at ORF, but uh, my respect for her goes uh, many leaps forward because she was involved in some of the rescue operations which took place in Afghanistan, pulling out people in distress. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, we have uh, Professor Vladimir uh, Sotnikov from Moscow. Uh, he's a senior research fellow in the Institute of Oriental Studies in the Russian Academy of Sciences a noted expert on Afghanistan. He's also a guest lecturer at the uh, Moscow State University. Uh, so thank you, Professor, for joining us. Uh, and last but not the least, we have uh, Dr. Mohsin uh, Shariatinya, uh, who is a professor in Tehran. Uh, he is attached to the uh, Shahid uh, Behashti uh, University. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mohsin, uh, for joining us. Uh, let me just start this webinar uh, by asking uh, Professor, uh, sorry, uh, Ambassador Ashraf Haidri uh, to give us his perspective uh, on on how he sees the uh, you know the regional situation and the likely responses of the regional players in uh, what is uh, unfolding in Afghanistan. Uh, Professor, uh, uh, sorry, Ambassador uh, Haidri. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying uh, Professor, but because there are all sorts of academics in this program today, but. Uh, Ambassador Haidri, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much uh, for that uh, introduction and also inviting an Afghan to be on this uh, panel. We always appreciate each time uh, there is uh, an effort made uh, to invite an Afghan man or woman. It doesn't really matter, diplomat or otherwise, because we know that uh, Afghanistan, unfortunately, has suffered uh, from uh, now 40 years of, you know, conflicts of geopolitics. And unfortunately, much of it has been rooted in the region. Um, we can go back into the Cold War and discuss the Soviet invasion uh, and occupation uh, of Afghanistan, which again would not have been uh, possible to be defeated without uh, sometimes regional support. And of course, what unfolded after the withdrawal of Soviet forces, regional interference and aggression, which Afghanistan uh, has been now uh, subjected to over the past uh, uh, 20 years, and especially the past uh, now uh, uh, four months. And so I'll just uh, go from here uh, discussing, and thanks again for having Afghans included. I'm also happy to be uh, a visiting fellow of the ORF and uh, appreciate uh, the focus by ORF, uh, not just on Afghanistan, but in the entire region and uh, what's happening and bringing different voices, not just 
from South Asia, but from across the world to uh, discuss these uh, vital uh, issues of interest uh, to the region and as well as to the uh, world consistent with the United Nations Charter uh, uh, underpinning um, international peace and uh, security. So uh, the region, uh, unfortunately, over the past 20 years has not been as uh, cooperative as uh, it uh, should have been. And uh, we can easily single out uh, the few countries neighboring Afghanistan, especially the one country that has uh, directly uh, been involved, I would say, not even indirect, because without their uh, support, uh, material, uh, military, uh, intelligence, even operational, uh, uh, covert, and increasingly over the past uh, four months over Afghanistan, of course, would not have been destabilized that after the fall of the Taliban uh, back in 2001, uh, which I don't need to discuss. We know the uh, prelude to that and the situation that brought 9-11 uh, and so forth, uh, that the Taliban would have been uh, defeated easily or they would not have even been able to uh, reemerge because their reconstitution effectively from 2003 as the United States invaded Iraq and effectively abandoned Afghanistan send a signal to the neighboring country that yes you can reconstitute the taliban and redeploy them and uh search of uh, uh strategic depth which unfortunately underpins the military doctrine of uh, our destructive uh, neighbor and exactly that's uh, what uh, they've done uh, from 2003 uh, up to 2009 uh, when the Obama administration uh, actually campaigned uh, based on withdrawing U.S. forces from Iraq, which was he called the wrong war, but uh, surging forces uh, and as well as uh, civilian aid, development, governance and rule of law support, and the right uh, war, which they had been neglecting under the Bush administration. We remember when Chairman uh, uh, of the Joint Chiefs of the Staff, uh, uh, Molin, uh, used to call Afghanistan a war of what we can versus a war of what we must, which was uh, Iraq. So the Obama administration, uh, of course, surged, but unfortunately, he announced a timetable, which again encouraged our neighboring country to continue uh, supporting uh, the uh, Taliban. And that's exactly uh, what they did. While the country fought the Taliban TTP on its own soil, but it uh, uh, continued supporting and enabling and sheltering the leadership and as well as their rank and file and uh, enabling them to destabilize uh, Afghanistan. And so coming back, and I'll go back to the points that I made about uh, uh, SEO. ECO discuss all those four threats. They have been issuing money declarations um, at the United Nations uh, Security Council already uh, too, and they've spoken very clearly at the SEO and the trilateral quadrilateral mechanisms and the BRICS very strong statement and the G7 of course our uh, Western allies and as well as in the G20 that recently. So the world and the region are very much on the same page when it comes to helping Afghanistan again uh, from where, again, it has ended up as it was in the 1990s against those threats. But when it comes to tangible action, we don't see it. It's not there, unfortunately. And uh, we tell them that unless you come back together on the same page, from India to Russia to China to Central Asian states. Uh, and I must say that the one country that has been really vocal, this is very small country, this is Tajikistan. Um, but bold and courageous and, and really, you know, speaking against everything and also taking action by simply not just talking, but also talking the walk. I mean, walking the talk. And so here I end up by calling on the region 
to act and uh, through the speakers here, I think, uh, which definitely could influence the debate and the discourse, policy debate and discourse or the think tankers in Washington uh, to uh, you know, bring to light the suffering of the Afghan people over the past uh, 40 years, being victims of uh, geopolitics and games of um, our region. Uh, but also, of course, uh, NATO and the rest, uh, which I discussed. So with that, I'll wait for the rest to discuss. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, okay, so uh, I think he's uh, said a lot on uh, Pakistan, and it's only fair uh, to ask Madhya to just step in. Uh, she can push back if she wants to. But, uh, but my question to her is, uh, uh, you know, initially after the Taliban, uh, you know, walked into Kabul, uh, we saw a sense of triumphalism in Pakistan. But over the last few weeks, <clears throat> at least among some sections of uh, the, the public opinion or people who make the public discourse in Pakistan or control the public discourse, uh, we do sense a, a kind of trepidation over what might await uh, Pakistan, partly because of the spike uh, in activities by the Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan, uh, but also because, uh, you know, that expectation that uh, the rest of the world will simply jump in and embrace the Taliban doesn't quite seem to be happening. And if that doesn't happen, uh, then, uh, you know, uh, do all the calculations go uh, completely wrong? Uh, perhaps uh, you could, uh, you know, just look at that aspect and tell us, uh, sitting in your, you know, from your perch in Washington, how are you seeing uh, the situation unfold, uh, Doctor Afzal? Thanks, thanks so much um, for for convening this um, this session and for bringing sort of this perspective of, um, you know, the regional. Uh, perspective. I mean, so often um, we look at things uh, from the perspective of, you know, the, the West. Um, and uh, I certainly have made an attempt. Uh, we, we held um, a, an excellent event uh, just last week at, at Brookings um, with uh, Afghan voices, uh, you know, looking at how uh, the Taliban regime has been uh, since it's been in power um, since August uh, and what we can expect from it and how the world should engage and can engage with it. So, you know, these are really, really important questions and I'm um, I'm happy that the world is keeping its focus on, on this. Um, so thank you again for convening the discussion. Um, from uh, the, the perspective of Pakistan, I think, you know, uh, Pakistan may have gotten closer to sort of achieving uh, its long sought after um, notion of strategic depth uh, in, in Afghanistan, but the Taliban's rise uh, in Afghanistan is far from a simple outcome for Pakistan. And I think there are various reasons and you pointed to them uh, in your question. Um, the first is uh, the, the fact that, you know, Pakistan is now making this case uh, for the world to engage with the Taliban uh, regime. Uh, and it says, you know, it's for humanitarian assistance, it's to strengthen and stabilize uh, Afghanistan, which it will be good, obviously, for the region and for the world. But when that case is made by Pakistan, um, it is not necessarily received very well, right? So the world is skeptical when Pakistan is the one making that case. So it's unclear that the world is ready to engage with this Taliban regime. And I think there is a real question of, you know, Afghanistan faces a dire, dire economic situation, right? I mean, since sort of the danger of humanitarian collapse, economic collapse, um, the, the central bank is effectively frozen, you know, inflation uh, has gone up, people, you know, are going hungry. I mean, this is um, a, a very dire situation. What does the world do? Does it engage with the Taliban regime sort of unconditionally? I mean, obviously, humanitarian aid must be provided to Afghanistan, right? And that is uh, that cannot be conditional 
on uh, on on anything, but anything else, any other aid, you know, how does the world use its policy levers of sanctions, of um, of uh, aid, of economic assistance with a regime like the Taliban, which it wants to try to moderate as much as it possibly can now that the reality is that it is in power. That is a real question for the international community. Again, uh, at the UN, you know, Pakistan has been making this case that the world um, that the world should engage uh, with the Taliban regime. Um, you know, having people like Sirajuddin Haqqani appointed as a caretaker interior minister or an interim uh, interior minister. You know, it's unlikely that the U.S. would engage with it overtly. Um, and while there have been a round of sort of second appointments made, of course, that expanded um, the cabinet in terms of ethnic lines, you know, we still see a completely non-inclusive government, obviously no women um, in, uh, in uh, the, the cabinet. And then, of course, there are so many uh, realities on the ground. You know, girls have not been allowed to go back to school, to secondary school. Um, I think it's day 16 or 17 of girls not being allowed to go back to secondary school. Um, women have not, many women have not uh, returned to work. There, uh, you know, are um, uh, reports of, uh, you know, extrajudicial killings, including of Hazara civilians that took place uh, just a couple of weeks after the Taliban came into power. So, you know, how does the world engage with this this kind of regime? I mean, that is the, the, the tough question without, you know, uh, sort of turning its back to the people of Afghanistan who are suffering. So that's a tough question. Where does, you know, where now does Pakistan come in? As I said, uh, it's making this case for engagement. The world is skeptical. I think this is causing problems, of course, also for Pakistan's relationship with the United States. Um, I, you know, in, in hearings that have been taking place on Capitol Hill with Secretary Blinken, uh, with um, Generals Milley and McKinsey, um, you know, there's, the U.S. wants to understand what went wrong right, in Afghanistan. The question of Pakistan then, of course, comes up. Uh, and so there is this kind of uh, desire to now, you know, look at what uh, exactly uh, Pakistan's support was for the Taliban over the last uh, 20 years. And there was a bill proposed by um, Republican senators uh, that uh, aims at, you know, having a report on this. Uh, but more generally, I think there is a, a bit of a look back happening at, at Pakistan. Pakistan insists that it must not be scapegoated um, or blamed for the outcome of the of the war in Afghanistan uh, and blamed for the Taliban's rise. You know, it points to um, the army uh, the uh, you know the, the the fact that the Afghan army obviously was uh, very very well equipped uh, and it it still uh, you know ended up uh, you know surrendering of course not you know Pakistan is not looking at sort of the the aspect of that where um, the Afghan army lost uh, the U.S. air and military support uh, that it had so uh, come to rely on over the last. Uh, uh, 20 years, uh, just over the summer. So essentially, I mean, you know, I think uh, there, the for for Pakistan's from Pakistan's perspective, what it sees um, is that it is being scapegoated in the U.S. The U.S. is looking at a whole host of things. I think in the in Washington, there is a recognition that this was a collective failure. That there are many. Um, uh, that that caused you know the outcome of the the, the war in Afghanistan, uh, but Pakistan's role uh, must be examined. That I think it, there is a consensus on, and there is a bipartisan consensus on. Uh, just very quickly on a couple of things, I think the TTP is uh, 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 now you know um, had been regrouping since last year. I think after the the Doha deal signed after, uh, with the uh, the Taliban um, and the, the the Trump administration, uh, that emboldened jihadist groups in the region. We saw the TTP starting to regroup last summer um, of 2020. Uh, but after uh, the Taliban's rise, there have been TTP uh, prisoners who were released from pr uh, prisons all over Afghanistan, and the TTP has, uh, you know, uh, increased its attacks um, uh, on Pakistani security forces. And we can see that the 
the new development, of course, here is that Pakistan has, um, the government has begun talks with some elements of the TTP. Um, and this is sort of a, a new revelation. I think the government had been talking about giving amnesty to the TTP, um, uh, or at least some elements of the TTP that were willing to give up arms um, and uh, you know basically stop uh, their insurgency. And now it's sort of made this public that they're in talks with some elements of the TTP. Now, this is a very worrying development for Pakistan, um, of course, because the government has negotiated with the TTP before in 2013, 2014, it didn't go anywhere. Uh, then the Zerbia's military operation began against the TTP. Um, and that succeeded in bringing terrorism down to a great extent. Um, I think uh, the the last thing I'll just mention in terms of sort of regional dynamics and the dynamics with the with the U.S. Uh, as well is that of course you know China has reluctantly in some ways embraced uh, the Taliban. Uh, its interests in the region are currently you know in terms of you know it wants stability in the region. Its interests are economically focused uh, in, in Pakistan in terms of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. It wants to make sure that uh, Afghanistan soil, Afghanistan soil is not used as a ground to um, attack uh, Chinese targets uh, and Chinese investments in Pakistan. Uh, secondarily, I think it wants to make sure that Afghan soil is not used to attack Uyghur um, uh, militants. Uh, 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 Afghan soil is not used by Uyghur militants to um, attack uh, China. And so it wants to maintain a relationship uh, in that sense. So the China-Pakistan kind of, um, the, 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 the incentives here seem to be that China-Pakistan uh, come closer uh, you know, even more than they are uh, already. Uh, the Biden administration uh, has made uh, clear that, you know, it, it's uh, tilt to Asia um, in its bid to counter China, you know, includes uh, a, a partnership with India. And so, you know, the, the dynamics uh, post-Afghanistan may shift uh, the, these uh, dynamics a little bit so that Pakistan moves closer to China and perhaps a little bit further away from the U.S., though, though Pakistan will uh, say that it does not want that. Um, but, I, but I think it will have repercussions beyond that. Um, and the final thing I'll say is that, you know, while Pakistan has been um, careful about not recognizing the Taliban regime like it did in the 1990s, um, uh, you know, when it was just one of three governments that recognized the, the, the Taliban regime. Um, right now, uh, it has uh, still, I think, uh, gone, you know, as, as some have said, gone to bat uh, uh, for the Taliban. Um, and that will be noticed by the world. And that is being noticed by the world. So it's a, it's a, a you know, sort of a tough kind of walk that it is sort of um, having to walk, basically saying, don't blame us uh, for the outcome in Afghanistan, you know, don't really look at us as the Taliban's allies, but look, you know, you know, we may still have we may still be able to have a moderating influence on the Taliban. Yes, we still have some influence over the Taliban. So I think the case is, look, we don't have complete influence over the Taliban, but we have some and the world should engage with it for peace in the region. I think whether, you know, to sum up, whether the world buys that or not um, is an open question. And at this point, I think the world is leaning more towards not than yes. I, actually, I have a, a number of questions to throw at you, but I'll, I'll come to you uh, in a bit. Uh, let me just give... Uh, let me just bring in Dr. Mohsen uh, Shariat Yanya. Uh, uh, Dr. Mohsen, uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Hydri uh, spoke about uh, the interference by Pakistan, uh, the support given to the Taliban. Uh, Madhya has also spoken about it. But the fact of the matter remains that uh, uh, there, were, there were very credible reports. And we know that uh, Iran was also engaged with the Taliban. Uh, but somehow... Uh, Whenever something really bad happens inside Afghanistan, the fallout is generally in Pakistan. Uh, Iran manages to insulate itself. So that is one uh, part of what I wanted to ask you. And the second part of it was that uh, within Iran, we have noticed, uh, you know, there are uh, there are old problems between uh, uh, between Iran and the Taliban which seemed to have been papered over as long as the Americans were present in Afghanistan. 
Uh, do you uh, do you anticipate some of those problems, and I mean the sectarian issues and others, uh, come to the fore? Uh, Dr. Afzal uh, mentioned about the massacre of the Hazaras, uh, reports of that coming out. Uh, and clearly, uh, we see apprehensions on uh, the Taliban behavior, and I'm sure uh, Iran is not entirely in agreement with much of what the Taliban are doing. There were also problems uh, when, uh, you know, the initial government formation happened. Uh, I, you know, it seemed that Iran was going into a bit of a sulk. Now, uh, how are you looking at the situation sitting in Tehran uh, with your ear to the ground on how Iran uh, is, uh, you know, perceives uh, the, the developing situation in Afghanistan? Uh, and, and what are the kind of policy options uh, that are being considered in Tehran? Please, Dr. Shariyatian. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, ORF for inviting me. A pleasure to talk to you and share with you my assessment on the new situation in Afghanistan and Iran's approach to the new Afghanistan. First and foremost, in my assessment, uh, the fall of Kabul was an a strategic surprise, not only for Iranian public opinion, but also for Iranian elite. And, and after Kabul, or the fall of Kabul, a heated debate uh, within an elite in Iran on the future of Afghanistan and on the Iran policy options, between the, especially between the mainstream of political uh, establishment, I mean reformist and principalist. Reformists arguing that Taliban is an enemy of Iran, is a threat against Iran ideologically, geopolitically, and also geoeconomically. Ideologically, because the Taliban represent uh, an extreme faction of Sunni political Islam that is naturally against Iran as a Shia branch of political Islam. They so represent Pashto nationalism that is against not only against Iran as a Persian country, but also against uh, Tajik and Hazara within Afghanistan and also against Tajikistan. And also they do believe that uh, Taliban is a threat because uh, Taliban has a negative attitude toward the trilateral cooperation between Iran, India, and Afghanistan in general. But on the other hand, principalist, uh, on the principalist faction, believe that the main threat against Iran in Afghanistan was the United States military bases. So the removal of the United States military bases, in their perspective, is a good news for them because it's reduced threat against Iran national security on eastern borders, and it could pave the way for more freedom of action for Iran in the future of Afghanistan. They do believe that the Taliban is not friend or foe, and Iran can shape uh, a workable relationship with the Taliban. Uh, the two sides are anti-American and the two sides are two branches of political Islam and they can cooperate together. Beyond the uh, political factions or political establishment, uh, Iran government establishment or the new administration, I mean the Raisi administration, adopt uh, a approach toward the Taliban. They emphasize on the uh, inclusive government in Afghanistan. And at the highest level, Iran said that uh, the future of the relationship between the two would depend to the future of Taliban interaction with Iran. But on the ground, it seems that Iran adopt a limited engagement without recognition toward the Taliban. They start limited economic and trade cooperation with the Taliban. 
but uh, it seems to me that recognition of the Taliban or recognize of the Taliban would not be on the Iran foreign policy agenda for the foreseeable future. Uh, in my assessment, Iran would support the mainstream of international community toward the Taliban on, on recognition or legitimize the Taliban. But it will continue to limit it and economic driven uh, uh, engagement with the Taliban uh, for the foreseeable uh, future. And also beyond the bilateral engagement with the Taliban, it seems that Iran, uh, the preferred option at the regional and global level for Iran is not a new geopolitical game, but is a regional multilateral way to resolve uh, the, the difficult situation within Afghanistan. Uh, Iran is increasingly engaged with India and China, Russia and Tajikistan. Indian Foreign Minister visited Iran two times since the Raisi administration took office. And the two sides negotiate on Afghanistan and the future of Afghanistan. It seems to me that the future of Chabahar is crucial for Iran, and India would remain a key partner of Iran uh, in the future of Afghanistan and the future of the Chabahar. Also, there is growing uh, cooperation between Iran and China in Afghanistan. In the past, there was no any meaningful uh, cooperation between Iran and China in Afghanistan, but it seems to me that the two countries are more and more closely cooperate together in Afghanistan. China uh, special representative to Afghanistan recently visited Iran and negotiate with high ranking officials in Tehran on the future of peace and ability in Afghanistan. And uh, on Shanghai cooperation at the bilateral level between the two uh, foreign ministers, the two sides negotiate on the future of Afghanistan. Uh, Russia historically was a key partner of Iran in Afghanistan. The two countries closely cooperate together in the past, and it seems to me that there is a common concern between Iran and Russia, especially regarding the Daesh and Daesh safe haven within Afghanistan. And on Tajikistan, it seems to me that uh, the two countries successfully resolve the dispute and uh, we have a lot of common cultural heritage uh, with Tajik and we have com common concern with Tajikistan on the future of minorities within Afghanistan. For this reason I do believe that Iran there is some hope in Iran to cooperate with the Tajikistan in the context of Shanghai Cooperation Organization or bilaterally uh, to influence on the Afghanistan development. Uh, let me conclude. Uh, I do believe that for the foreseeable future, uh, Iran will continue to its limited engagement toward Taliban without recognition. And economic and trade uh, diplomacy would remain more of limited in engagement approach toward the Taliban. But uh, it seems to me that Iran, there is a growing concern in Iran in the future direction of Afghanistan. And there is a growing concern on the uh, on how to adapt to situation in Afghanistan. And there is an ongoing debate within a society among the elite on the best approach or the best option toward uh, Afghanistan and toward the Taliban. But it seems to me right now in the coming month, the priority of Iran would not be Afghanistan. It would be the nuclear deal and the future of the nuclear deal. The main priority would be restoring of the nuclear deal. Uh, 
and it seems that Iran will try to adapt uh, to the situation in Afghanistan rather than trying to shape or have an influence on the future of the country. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shariat Janya. Uh, let me just uh, now take this uh, further north uh, and go to Anahita uh, because Anahita, you've heard uh, our other uh, colleagues on the show. Uh, and, and frankly, Tajikistan seems to become be becoming a sort of a linchpin uh, on whatever might happen next in Afghanistan. Because if there is going to be some kind of a resistance, and we don't know if there will be, uh, probably uh, it comes from uh, Tajikistan. Uh, the, the position which the Tajik government has taken uh, is very different from what most of the other countries are taking. Uh, Tajikistan's president and other leaders uh, have made noises which uh, uh, which uh, might sound music uh, to the ears of people who are not exactly very fond of the Taliban. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not very sure if uh, those have been well received in, in, in uh, inside Afghanistan, at least among the Taliban circles. We are also hearing about tensions along the border uh, and all sorts of other things. And perhaps uh, when you... Uh, when you say what you're going to, whatever you're going to say from uh, the perspective of Dushanbe, uh, if you can tell us uh, if there's any truth to the rumors uh, that uh, people from the resistance or the National Resistance Front, the NRF, uh, there are rumors that some of them might have uh, moved in and taken refuge in uh, Tajikistan. Is there any truth to that? Especially since you're a journalist. Uh, so so uh, the floor is yours, Anayat, please. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, so very briefly, yes, regarding this uh, anti-Taliban resistance, uh, actually, um, we, are, we don't know, but during the meeting uh, of Tajik President Emmali Rahman with the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan, they talked about uh, this uh, to give a floor, like to have a platform in Dushanbe between the Taliban fighters and the anti-Taliban resistance. Uh, for the time being, I also heard these rumors, but you know, it's not confirmed. You can hear that some people say that Ahmad Masood, uh, he's in Dushanbe or he was in Dushanbe one month, uh, he was here, but now i don't know some people say he was like four days here all these rumors are not confirmed and you know uh, working as a journalist in tajikistan also you have some kind of your own restrictions uh so uh, i think um because of this formal meeting between uh, the prime minister of pakistan and tajik president uh soon uh we will have uh, like, you know, there will be a meeting between the Taliban and the anti-Taliban resistance in Dushanbe. Uh, so regarding the uh, position of Tajikistan, you are right, because uh, Tajikistan is a very small country, but I think now the Tajik government has a very, you know, open and vocal statement regarding the Taliban. And uh, the tension at the border, it's real, uh, because the Tajik government and even uh, like ordinary people in Dushanbe, we feel this threat, uh, as you know, because the uh, there are some Tajik fighters in Afghanistan. They are members of, uh, of some uh, radical terrorist organization like Ansurullah, uh, so it was uh, f uh, built by the Tajik fighter. Uh, I mean, uh, so there is a real threat. Uh, but the other question, uh, because uh, the Taliban, uh, like now threatening Tajikistan, but it's just on Twitter, but also we heard uh, they have some military exercises uh, near the border as well. And of course, also from the Tajik side, uh, the Tajik government sent like additionally 20,000 soldiers to the border to Badakhshan uh, and also as a member of collective security treaty organization um, uh, like we had this joint uh, the Tajik side uh, with other countries they had this joint military drills uh, here um, regarding I mean um, like two uh, two issues here I can see it's about the security real threat uh, because uh, also it's a, a question in Tajikistan also we have this kind of um, people with radical minds you know uh, and that's why the Tajik government is really afraid um, because if uh, Afghanistan and I'm not sh uh, and I'm sure that the Taliban uh, they are very decentralized power they have they can't control their 
own country and some kind of uh, jihadist fighters can cross the border, you know, and they can destabilize Tajikistan. And we should know that uh, Tajikistan is a part of Central Asia and uh, originally, uh, you know, it's a uh, even now, Russia is the main guarantee of our security. It was and it's now, even now. Uh, so that's why uh, the Tajik government uh, relies on uh, Russian assistance, military assistance. So there is a cooperation between uh, Tajikistan and Russia, of course. Uh, the other question about the refugees, I think there is an overall uh, kind of fear in Central Asian countries because uh, even the Kazakh president uh, during the meeting in Dushanbe, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, he said that uh, we have the fear that among the refugees uh, there can be some uh, jihadists, you know, this is a real threat as well. But as you know, I uh, also worked with this evacuation mission uh, here in Dushanbe and the Tajik gov government gave a transit uh, for these people, uh, then they left to Abu Dhabi. Uh, so there is uh, these two main issues I can say about uh, this, the security uh, that it's really concerning in Tajikistan and it's not only the, about the government, even ordinary people uh, thinking about it. And the, th uh, the second part is about the refugees flow. So that's it. Uh, uh, thanks, Anaita. Uh, yes, you're right, because uh, I think the fear of, uh, you know, militancy spilling over into uh, the regional countries is a very real one. Uh, and uh, and I'm sure uh, that must be a matter of great concern. Uh, finally, I'm coming to uh, uh, Professor uh, Sotnikov. Uh, sorry for keeping you waiting till the last, but, you know, we keep the best for the last always. Uh, but I wanted a perspective because, uh, you know, Russia is one of the most important players in the region. Uh, and I think it's extremely critical uh, to understand, uh, you know, what's the perspective from Moscow? Because uh, Moscow has been engaged with the Taliban. Uh, when we look at some of uh, the stuff which is coming out of Pakistan, uh, where there is this talk of a new uh, grand regional alliance, uh, of Pakistan, uh, Russia, Iran, and perhaps China. China, of course. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we, are, we are seeing talk about these kind of new uh, quadrilateral arrangements coming in, hinged around Afghanistan. Uh, but suddenly we see that while the Russians were very keen at one point of time uh, and, and were not very averse to seeing the Taliban come into power or come into some kind of, uh, you know, uh, power structure in Afghanistan, uh, we see a kind of a distancing ever since they've acquired power. Uh, but I wanted to know from you how Russia perceives the situation and how, uh, you know, uh, things are likely to play out as far as Moscow is concerned uh, in the future. Please, uh, Professor uh, Sotnikov. Uh, Sushant, thank you very much for having me on this very interesting webinar. and. Uh, I'm just uh, saying my best regards to my colleagues uh, from from the regional countries. Uh, uh, the, I, I heard uh, with great interest the um, uh, presentations from my colleagues from uh, Pakistan, from Tajikistan, from Iran, and of course the um, uh, His Excellency the Ambassador, Afghan Ambassador to Colombo. And uh, uh, thank you very much, ORF, for also for um, ha having opportunity. Uh, to invite me to this uh, webinar. Actually, uh, I would start uh, probably from uh, the point that uh, for Russia, it was uh, somehow expected and both an expected uh, uh, event uh, in terms of uh, coming uh, of uh, Taliban to power and uh, the taking uh, Kabul. Uh, Russia actually voiced concerns even uh, a year ago, or even more than a year ago, about such uh, an unhappy possibility of uh, Taliban coming to power. That's why Russia actually tried to facilitate uh, the peaceful process uh, in Afghanistan, facilitate uh, the efforts of uh, the previous uh, Afghan government uh, to take part in the direct contacts with uh, Taliban 
uh, Taliban representatives. Uh, that's why there were Moscow round. By the way, uh, uh, soon in Moscow will be another Moscow round, the consultations on Afghanistan. So uh, Russia actually was very much concerned with the whole situation uh, long before uh, Taliban came to power. Just shortly saying, I would like to say that uh, uh, Russia actually uh, is very much concerned about the situation in Afghanistan from regional perspective and uh, from the um, prospect of uh, uh, security for uh, uh, Russia itself. From regional prospects, from regional perspective, Russia uh, very much understands and very much concerned that uh, the uh, rise, the new rise of Taliban power in Afghanistan. Uh, could lead to the um, flow of uh, uh, international jihadi groups uh, from uh, Af Afghani soil to, first of all, to the uh, Russian allies in uh, Central Asia, like, like Tajikistan. And my colleague actually mentioned that, uh, saying that uh, Russia really has a, a good uh, military relations and cooperation uh, with the uh, Tajik government right now. So this is uh, a much concern for Russia. And uh, because uh, from, from, that, from that stand, the jihadi groups can actually uh, flow uh, even more northwards to, to, to Russian central part. And we know the, the cases, uh, then uh, jihadi groups uh, uh, affiliated uh, or just uh, who were naming themselves like uh, belonging to ISIS and other jihadi groups uh, uh, were arrested, uh, arrested in, in Moscow and in other Russian cities. So this is really, really uh, a concern for Russia in terms of uh, uh, terror, terror, terror um, threat. Uh, from regional wise uh, um, point of view, I would say that uh, Russia actually is trying to uh, have consultations with all uh, stakeholders, uh, with all countries of the Central Asia. And uh, uh, simultaneously, Russian uh, presidential envoy, uh, director of the second uh, department of Asia in the Russian foreign minister, Mr. Kabulov, Zamir Kabulov, is uh, making some shuttle diplomacy efforts, uh, uh, trotting down from uh, from uh, Kabul to Islamabad, from Islamabad to uh, to Delhi, and um, backwards. So uh, Russia is trying to have an approach of, uh, uh, I would say, I would call it myself like a preventive diplomacy, uh, because. Uh, um, the previous efforts of any preventive diplomacy from the side of all regional stakeholders, they somehow, to my mind, failed because Taliban actually is in power and nothing could, can be done about that. So, I mean, that preventive diplomacy, to my uh, opinion, is that uh, uh, Russia is trying to uh, somehow accommodate uh, the possible, uh, possible participants uh, uh, and possible partners in terms of um, coming down the situation in Afghanistan, and first of all, uh, fighting the terror group uh, on Afghani soil, uh, and what uh, could be done about that. So uh, I, I'm just very thankful to my Iranian colleague who was saying that, to his mind, that uh, uh, Russia actually had had um, a good um, uh, relationship and good cooperation in terms of Afghanistan. Yes, that, that, that's correct. And uh, uh, Russia is seeing that all regional stakeholders uh, should accommodate their efforts just to, to fight off this terror, terror, um, terror threat, uh, terrorist threat. And another thing, uh, Russia if you notice that from the very beginning, there were very, very uh, reserved remarks about the situation in Afghanistan and the communication was through the Russian embassy uh, to Kabul. The uh, uh, Russian ambassador Zhirnov was uh, commenting on what was going on. And I was a little bit surprised myself that uh, Taliban, Taliban actually um, proclaimed and uh, said that uh, from the very beginning of, of their the, the days in Kabul that uh, they will not provoke Russia and they put a guard, a, a Taliban guard, uh, on the outside perimeter of a Russian embassy. That was quite a remarkable sign. 
I took it, and every 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 academic in in, in Russia took it that uh, Taliban doesn't want at the moment uh, to provoke Russia in anything because, uh, uh, as you know, that the previous Taliban regime uh, in Kabul in, in back in nineties. Uh, it, it actually took a very anti-Russia position. So I think that uh, in this case, in, in these uh, circumstances, uh, the Taliban regime t is trying to show to Russia that uh, mm, uh, it has a peaceful intentions, it has uh, uh, nothing to, against Russia and uh, so, so on and so forth. But uh, Russia actually is thinking that uh, uh, the Taliban cannot trust only in what's that uh, we need just to see the concrete specific deeds what Taliban is doing actually and so far so far uh, Taliban uh, didn't uh, uh, form up uh, the inclusive government which was a Russian suggestion on the um, uh, negotiations between Russian ambassador and Taliban representatives uh, inclusive government uh, so far there is abuse of uh, women and women's rights uh, in, in Afghanistan. So uh, we have to see here in Moscow what Taliban is really uh, up to and then decide decide how to accommodate our relationship uh, in terms of uh, maintaining contacts with Taliban. Of course, Russia will maintain contact in the future because uh, from our point of view, whatever regime will be in, in Afghanistan, it's very important from the point of security for regional stakeholders and for Russia itself. But to what extent these contacts be, it's still unclear. The only thing which is clear that uh, Russia will deal with any government uh, uh, in Afghanistan unless it is uh, clearly anti-Russian and uh, um, anti, um, anti, um, uh, uh, and, and actually aimed at uh, uh, anti, anti sentiments against uh, SCO, against uh, CSTO and other uh, uh, Russian uh, and uh, Central Asian partners organizations. Uh, in terms of Tajikistan, I would say that uh, I don't think that because there were some questions voiced by Western um, commentators that uh, would Russia uh, send uh, uh, any troops uh, to Afghanistan at some point in the future? My answer is no. Under no circumstances, Russia will repeat uh, the situation uh, which we are see. Which, which we saw actually in back in the uh, end of uh, 70s and uh, in the 80s that uh, uh, Soviet Union has sent troops uh, to help uh, the um, uh, Democratic Party of Afghanistan government to, to stay in power so and to fight uh, Mujahideen. No, this is not a way uh, for Russia. This is not an option for Russia. So. Uh, as regards to Tajikistan, Tajikistan, our partner in the C CSTO and Collective Security Organization, an active partner, and uh, if uh, there will be a sort of any hot conflict between Tajikistan and Afghanistan, uh, whatever could be, or there will be even a war between Tajikistan, between Afghanistan, sorry, between Afghanistan and Tajikistan. Russia will support uh, on the consent uh, consent of all uh, members, uh, uh, high level members of uh, uh, CSTO, will support Tajikistan in every way. So uh, we actually stand for the peaceful solution for negotiations, which we expect uh, Taliban should do not provoking its neighbors, uh, whether it's uh, southwards or northwards. And we're trying to engage all possible stakeholders like India, Pakistan, uh, Iran, uh, China, to how, um, how somehow to make the situation more stable and predictable. That's probably okay. what, what I would like to say. Uh, thank you. Uh, so now I just have about 15 minutes or so, and I have a lot of questions in my mind. But let me shoot the first one at you, Professor Sotnikov. Uh, two very quick questions. Number one, you know, we keep hearing about uh, getting the whole region together. But we also see that most of the countries of the region have contending interests. Uh, and those interests uh, are often uh, in conflict with each other. Uh, so uh, number one, uh, isn't this... Uh, a completely counterproductive exercise 
try to get all the regions, uh, countries of the region together on a common page. I don't see it happen. And secondly, uh, you know, when you say that uh, Russia is holding on uh, and Russia wants to wait and see what the Taliban do, uh, but you also mention an inclusive government. Nobody really knows what an inclusive government in the current context is. And you mention about women rights and human rights. Uh, but then you go on to say that regardless of which the what the regime is, uh, you know, Russia will engage with it. But if uh, Afghanistan, as is likely to become a horror show uh, under the Taliban, as far as uh, minority rights, women rights, human rights are concerned, uh, will Russia still want to engage with a regime like that or not? I don't have too much time, so I'll give you one minute, sir, uh, or two minutes to answer that. Okay. And then I'll, right. I, I have other questions. All right. All right. So, uh, Sushant, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question. You yeah, really raised uh, very good questions, actually. Just very briefly, I would say that uh, when I'm saying that Russia will be engaged in uh, dealing with any regime in Kabul, uh, I said, uh, by the way, I said that unless it is anti-Russian and uh, terrorist regime, so uh, I'm just adding like, like right now, un uh, unless it is anti-Russia and, un and terrorist regime. So, of course, Russia will not maintain contacts uh, uh, with uh, some uh, brutal terrorists who, uh, that, that the Taliban could turn, could turn though, although I... I think that uh, this is Taliban 2.0, so, and uh, um, uh, even with abuse of uh, uh, the women's rights and uh, with uh, any uh, un, un, uh, with, uh, other unpleasant acts, uh, Taliban uh, will actually try to uh, polish, polish uh, itself uh, to some extent. I don't know, I don't know whether it will be, but uh, uh, I'm just uh, saying that uh, we shall wait and see because uh, uh, still uh, no any uh, remarkable signs of what Taliban could do in the future. They are just forming, uh, has formed their government. Uh, they are proclaiming any any aims, but uh, nothing real, nothing specific uh, was actually done. Uh, um, Un unless that they are just trying to kill or, or try to uh, or kill the um, Hazareas, uh, they just uh, make some um, hanging and uh, uh, chopping off the uh, hands of uh, uh, those uh, uh, accused of uh, stealing and anything like that. So that might be that might be a repetition of what we have seen in the 90s. But uh, uh, that's why the only thing uh, for for Russia just to uh, uh, maintain the contact with Taliban, to try to engage them uh, in um, forming up the real inclusive government. I think this is the point of negotiations, probably, I don't know for sure, but probably, which uh, special rep presidential representative uh, um, uh, is talking with Taliban representatives, and probably there will be, um, uh, this, this question will be raised uh, on the um, upcoming uh, Moscow round of talks and consultations. And uh, another thing in terms of what, uh, uh, how Russia is perceiving uh, to engage uh, uh, the region and other stakeholders. Yes, you are right. There are some differences in the approach and uh, differences uh, right in Afghanistan uh, between uh, China uh, and other stakeholders. But uh, uh, the question, the, the, the ultimate question is not just to uh, have uh, uh, these differences prevailing, but the question is how collectively, collectively to um, try to persuade uh, the new Taliban regime in uh, Kabul uh, to be uh, more susceptible to to, to any decent, well, well I, I'm not afraid to say this, what, to be decent rulers of Afghanistan, like that. Thank, thank you, Professor. Uh, Mat, Dr. Uh, Dr. Afzal, if I can just come to you, because I have just too many questions, but I don't have the time, but uh, I, I'm sure you'll uh, do justice in the two, three minutes that I have for you. The first, uh, is Afghanistan now becoming a strategic black hole for Pakistan? Or does it actually give Pakistan strategic depth? Second, you talk about uh, you know humanitarian assistance, and we know that yes, it is a huge problem going forward in 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 the kind of meltdown that is taking place right now. But uh, what are the chances that humanitarian assistance becomes a kind of a backdoor to recognition of the Taliban? Uh, 
you know, uh, and 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 the suspicion is that because the Pakistanis are plugging this line so uh, assiduously, uh, maybe that they see this as a kind of a backdoor uh, to the recognition of the Taliban. Uh, and finally, uh, sitting in Washington, uh, we see palpable anger. Uh, and and as you very rightly said that yes there is some degree of scapegoating of pakistan but do you think this will just be venting the spleen or do you uh, do you have apprehensions that it could be something much more than that i short three uh, questions i know you could speak on these for maybe an hour or longer but i just have about 3 minutes or so for you sure um so the the first question um, around um, hum so the black hole question. Um, yeah, I think it is uh, the you know Afghanistan is a really tough spot uh, for Pakistan and Pakistan's position on Afghanistan is really tough. I think uh, it, it puts it in a tough spot and that really comes from the fact that the Taliban uh, got this military victory. Uh, in, in Afghanistan. You know, Pakistan had been part of, uh, you know, partnering with the U.S. Uh, with the intra-Afghan peace negotiations, trying to put pressure on, on the Taliban before that, and the U.S. Doha peace process. If there had been a peaceful outcome in Afghanistan where it was some sort of power sharing agreement between the Ghani government and um, the, the Taliban that had emerged, I think Pakistan would be in a very different spot. As it is currently, you know, the with the Taliban having gained this military victory, Pakistan is seen as an ally in that, and it threatens to take it to uh, a near pariah status along with the Taliban, depending on how the world chooses to engage with the Taliban. Pakistan, I think the Taliban doesn't want a repeat of the 1990s, you know, that prior status. Pakistan doesn't want to be allied with the Taliban in that repeat of the 1990s. So, so we know that that is the case. Where uh, does this go uh, for Pakistan? I think that's why it's saying, you know, it's not in any hurry to recognize. I think the, rec the question of recognition for Pakistan will come with at least regional countries, if not the broader international community. But I think the question on, in, on the question of engagement, that's where it's already separating itself a little bit. Although we have seen that um, there are officials from the, the UK who were in uh, Afghanistan uh, this week as well. And so the world is starting to slowly engage. I think the question of, uh, so, so, so for Pakistan, I think it's a, it's a matter to be seen, but it puts it in a very tricky position. That's the answer to the first question. On humanitarian aid, I think, you know, the consensus among people who work on Afghanistan is that humanitarian aid should be seen as separate. There is, I think, a danger of any other forms of assistance that might benefit the Taliban regime and might be seen as sort of a first step in kind of certainly legitimacy, if not recognition. And I think the dilemma in front of the international community is this. You know, Afghanistan faces dire economic humanitarian needs. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the, you know, the Taliban regime is one that the world does not want to recognize or legitimize unconditionally. Uh, and it is not showing action on the very things the world wants it to show action on girls education women's rights human rights you know minority rights and so where does the world go from here i think the first step uh, that that many seem to agree on and that there seems to be a consensus on is that humanitarian aid doesn't need to flow through the taliban right but humanitarian aid should reach the the people that it needs to reach the Afghans ordinary civilians men women and children who are suffering uh, but it should not go through the Taliban and I think the international community uh, is um, leaning on the side of conditionality for everything else as it should um, so I, at this point you know I, I don't see humanitarian aid uh, posing um, a danger in the sense that it might uh, you know lead to a, a premature uh, legitimization or recognition for the for the Taliban, and I think the question of the uh, of the U.S. Pakistan relationship. I think you know I I and I'll note again. I think Pakistan 
thinks it's being scapegoated. I think the, the discussion in Washington is actually a broader discussion. You know, Pakistan, of course, looks at the discussion on Pakistan in Washington, but the discussion in Washington is broader. It is, you know, what you know, what uh, kind of training was provided to the Afghan security forces? Did it enable them to become independent? You know, it's it's sort of a much broader introspection that is going on, and Pakistan is one part of that. Uh, that being said, I don't, you know, uh, sort of bottom line, I don't see the U.S.-Pakistan relationship as, you know, turning the page from this smoothly. Uh, at this point, uh, turning the page away from Afghanistan smoothly because, you know, this this question of what happened over the last 20 years is a question that Washington will be grappling with. And that when when that question is in the back of the minds of many in Washington, it will be hard to justify a relationship with Pakistan that is a broad based economic you know, uh, relationship based on trade and other avenues when that now looms large with the, you know, with the, the constant sight of the Taliban next door and uh, to, to, to Pakistan. So, so long story short, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's really, it's sort of tough times ahead uh, for the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. And I don't quite think the relationship uh, can turn the page the way Pakistan wants it to. Uh, thanks, Dr. Afsal. Uh, Dr. Sharia Tianya, uh, two very quick questions. One, you know, you spoke about uh, the Daesh uh, and its presence out there. Uh, but how serious is the threat from the uh, Daesh or the ISKP, as it's called, in Afghanistan uh, to Iran or to the region? Uh, I probably look at it more as a purely, uh, you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan kind of a centric threat uh, and not the kind of... Uh, you know, threat which the Islamic State or Daesh, uh, while it was in Iraq and Syria, poses. That is one. Uh, and secondly, with the uh, with the exit of the United States from Afghanistan, uh, you know, the, the the divisions between uh, the principalists and the uh, you know the the, the progressive element uh, in Iran. Do you think that their positions have kind of uh, come closer? Uh, or are those uh, differences still persisting? I just have two minutes, sir. If I know, I know I'm really running out of time. But if you can uh, do it, please. Yeah. On Daesh, uh, uh, on Daesh, I don't know um, how it's serious, but there are uh, uh, great concern in Iran on the. Uh, Daesh or IS safe haven in Afghanistan. And uh, you know that uh, the main target of Daesh uh, and the main difference of Daesh and Al-Qaeda is that the main target of Al-Qaeda was Western countries, but the main target of Daesh is Shia Islam or Shia countries. And Iran sees itself as a potential target of Daesh. For this reason, I do, do believe that one of the key uh, aspect of the future of relationship between Iran and the Taliban, the capability or willingness of the Taliban to combat to Daesh. On the second question, it seems to me that the division between the two camps is uh, continue, but uh, it seems that the Iranian government uh, adopt uh, uh, an approach between principalist and progressive. I mean, continue to limited engagement with the Taliban without recognition of the Taliban. Uh, because recognition of the Taliban, uh, progressive didn't and don't support all uh, recognition of, of the Taliban. A progressive of reformist strongly support uh, resistant movement that led to Ahmad Masood. For this reason, I do believe that uh, the government had uh, an approach between principalist and... Thank you. All that had to be said has been said. Uh, you've heard all the opinions and, and, and we uh, hope to carry forward these conversations uh, in, in the months ahead. Uh, also have a couple of other webinars, including uh, from a purely South Asian perspective, how countries in South Asia uh, look at what's happening in Afghanistan and uh, 
much larger global uh, perspective uh, on how the big powers, other big powers look at what is happening, including the Western opinion uh, and opinion in other parts of the world. Uh, but thank you uh, very much uh, for being with us. Uh, thanks a lot to all the panelists who've taken out the valuable time uh, and, and, uh, and given us their perspectives uh, from their respective countries. Uh, thank you very much uh, and goodbye.